This morning I want us to look at two texts in your Bible, one in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament. The first scripture is found in the good old prophetic book of Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. But I got a better translation than that. The English Standard Version says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare and not your calamity to give you a future and a hope. But then the better one I love is Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. The apostle Paul, inspired by the Spirit of God, said, but my God, who everybody? My God shall supply some of your needs, most of your needs, all your need, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I want to talk for just a little bit this morning on finances, faith, and our future. Finances, faith, and our future. Economic issues are the top priority of the news. Um, President Trump is over meeting with the European leaders. He's going to talk with the Chinese Prime Minister. It's all about finances. But finances are not only a priority, they are a problem today. Some folks think we're a little better off, but I don't know about that. This economic concern is not just for Americans, but for people all over the world. You know about the current caravan refugees that are trying to come over to the United States and uh, illegal aliens that continue to come, they are driven by the economic crisis in their own countries. And um, I have a word to say about that. Fences ain't going to stop them. <laughs> People can get creative with fences. You think I'm kidding? Put up a fence in your house and see if they'll stop the burglars. Fences are not the problem. Uh, I mean, fences are just like trying to deal with the leaves on the tree. But that ain't the root. What our government needs to do is to go and work with those countries that are having the economic problems that is the cause of why the people want to leave in the first place. If they were doing better, if they could, if we could work to help them to make it better, they wouldn't be coming to our shores. Am I right about it? Americans are watching to see how the China Trade Summit will affect the U.S. economy and whether the president is going to make it bad or worse. Also, we are critically concerned about debt unemployment, interest rates, and poverty. The new Republican so-called tax cut, it's a tax cut all right, but it will help the rich and will hurt the middle class and the lower economic classes. Instead of lowering the taxes, it will actually raise the taxes for many middle class and poor families. The rich are getting richer. The poor 
are getting poorer. Therefore, every family and every individual must daily be concerned about finances and must daily deal with the challenging issues of finances. And you came this morning to hear the word of God and to worship, but in the back of your mind there is a financial issue. <laughs> there is some financial challenge. Unless all of y'all are multimillionaires, somebody's got a financial problem. I know what I'm talking about. Even the preacher. How can we make it in these tough and trying economic times? How can we make it with a president who seems to be more concerned about the Mueller investigation and, and, and then about the economy of, of those that are struggling to make it uh, and a Congress that seems to be helpless? How can we make it with rising medical costs? And then they want to get rid of Obamacare, but they ain't got nothing better to replace it with. In fact, it gets worse. You know what I said about Obamacare? At least Obama cares. <laughs> How do we make it? With stagnant waste, uh, uh, wages and... Uh, are our finances totally dependent upon the economy of the nation or the economy of the world? Are our finances totally dependent upon the political powers who seem to be in control? Are we merely the tragic victims of powerful, greedy men? Are we merely the evil effects of evolution and that there's no God and things are just going to go like they're going. Thank God I can say by the authority of the word of God that is not the case. It has never been the case and it never will be the case. We have a benevolent, loving, divine creator and sustainer who daily cares for his creatures and provides for his people. Last Sabbath, uh, Wednesday night, I was talking about from Psalms where the Bible says that God daily gives benefits to people. Every day, the blessings of God are poured out upon this earth. And if God did not pour out his blessings upon the earth, we would all be dead. Suppose the Lord decided to let the sun go out for just one day. Or let it, let it stop raining for over a year. You think we got fires now? Lord have mercy. Suppose for some reason the air got poisoned. You know, they tell me that our air is a delicate mixture of oxygen with other elements. And if there was too little oxygen, we'd all suffocate to death. And if there was too much oxygen, uh, one match would blow up the world. And God has critically and delicately balanced the oxygen in the air. But suppose he just stopped the air. Lord have mercy we would be in bad shape. The psalmist reminds us in Psalms 24 and verse 1, you know it, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. The reason why the earth is the Lord's is because he made it. He created it. He framed it. He formed it. He spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. God created life. But as you know, just creating life is not enough. Life has to be sustained. Am I right about it? 
In order for life to be fully abundant, God had to provide for the sustaining of life. Can you say amen? When you read the creation story of God creating the world in six days, I want you to notice before God created man, he provided everything that was necessary for man's sustenance uh, and for man's survival before he created man, Minister Robinson. He created everything before man got here. You know, suppose God wasn't even thinking he made man before he created the food or the water or the air, and we had to wait around for that to come. <laughs> oh, no, God had it right. And when he finished making it, it was not just good, it was very good. That means it had God's perfection guarantee upon it, and life was created, and life was to be sustained, and man was created to live forever. Man was created to live forever. The planet was able to sustain life to a, to a certain time, but God gave man two elements that would give him eternal life. The first thing, he gave him contact with his creator. Face to face, contact with God. Just being able to be in the presence of God will sustain and continue to give you life. I mean direct face-to-face -face communication and contact. The second thing is when God's direct presence wasn't there, he gave him the tree of life. And as long as man had access uh, to eat of the tree of life, it would replenish his body, it would restore him, uh, and he would continue to live on and on forever, access to the tree of life. And even when man was cut off from having access to the tree of life, the average lifespan of early men that had eaten of the tree of life was over 900 years old. Over 900 years old. Our inspired messenger says that Adam and Eve had 20 times the life power that we have. 20 times. Now, if you've got an immune system that's 20 times stronger than what we have, you don't get no colds, you don't get no fever, you don't get no uh, flu, you, you don't even get no cancer. Your body is so strong, it will repel all of these illnesses and diseases because, remember, their bodies were 20 times stronger, 20 times the life force. I guess it was so mean that if Adam cut his finger, he could see it heal in about a minute. Lord have mercy. So God is the giver and has sustained all humanity. And he still sustains us even after sin. He sustains all humanity and provides blessings for everybody. Psalms 145 verse 16 says, Thou openest thy hand and satisfied the desire of the need of every living thing. Everything is alive because God satisfies and God provides for what they need. And then Jesus said in Matthew 5, 45, God maketh his son to shine on the evil and on the good, and he sendeth the rain on the just, and on the unjust. You know, we serve a God so good that there are blessings that he gives even if you don't serve him. Even if you don't recognize him. God, I think, blesses the evil and the unjust because of the just. <laughs> because of those that follow the Lord. Can you say amen? And so God blesses us all. However, let me point out that faith in God will do something above what happens ordinarily. It will reward our prosper prosperity and it will bless our finances. Let me say that again. Faith in God 
will reward our prosperity and it will bless our finances. Do you know that how we speak and how we handle money depends on what we believe? You spend money based on what you believe. You give money based on what you believe. You go out and buy stuff because of what you believe. And what you buy and what you use it for, you basically believe that it's going to be good and good for you. Am I right about it? But it's based on what you believe. If our finances were connected to our faith in God, we would receive the full blessings of God. Oh, you missed that. I said that if our finances were connected to our faith in God, then we would receive the full blessings of God. God's blessings are based on a few things. First of all, God's blessings are based upon God's ability. God's what, everybody? God's what, everybody? God's ability. God has to have the ability to bless in order to bless. Am I right about it? Now, we believe theologians use the term omnipotence, and that means that God is all-powerful, that God can do anything, that he is the divine creator, and that he can create anything and in order for him to bless us, he's got to have the ability to bless us. Does he have the ability? Hear what Paul said in Ephesians 3 and verse 20. I love this text. It says, now unto him. Now unto whom, everybody? Him who is able. Who is what, everybody? Able. To do exceeding abundantly, or what? Exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Uh, my Bible tells me, uh, Paul says that we serve a God uh, who is able uh, not only to do what we ask, uh, able to do what we need, uh, but he's able to do above all that we can even think about. He's able to do everything above what we even ask for. We get on our knees and we ask the Lord, to help us, and the Lord thinks about beyond that. <laughs> you think about that moment. God's looking down the road. <laughs> Am I right about it? Because he sees the end from the beginning, uh, and he can do abundantly. I would just take the word abundantly. <laughs> he can do abundantly, but it says abundantly above. Above abundance, Lord have mercy. Above abundance. And above what we can ask or what we can think according to the power that worketh in us. But not only that, God gives us human beings the power to get wealth. Did you know that? that God gives us the power to be able to generate money, income, and wealth. Deuteronomy chapter 8, God made this promise to the children of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18. Uh, you probably heard this text before, but I, I think you ought to recognize that, that, that God is the giver and gives us also. He gives it to us, but he also gives us the ability to gain wealth. It says, verse 18, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power. Giveth thee what, everybody? Power. Why? What does he give us Power. To get wealth. Lord have mercy. God gave you the power to earn an income. He gave, gave you power 
to get wealth. He gave you power to be able to make money and to be able to sustain and support yourself. You know, some people think that God's just going to do it all. They don't have to do nothing about it. In fact, there's some people that don't think they need to work. They don't think they, they need to work. We are um, Sabbatarians. We believe in the Sabbath. And we emphasize, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. But we forget another part of that text. It says, six days shall thou Six days shall thou what? Labor. Labor and do all thy work. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Is the commandment trying to tell us <laughs> that when we come to the Lord's house on the Sabbath, we should have done some labor? You should have done some labor whether you were paid for it <laughs> or not. Am I right about it? You should have done some labor even if it's just cleaning up your house. Is that right? By the way, some folk need to clean up their houses. Uh, you know, I don't want to go on with that. But uh, you, you, you ought to come Sabbath uh, so that we can celebrate that God has given me the ability to perform labor. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. So that when you've labored six days, when the Sabbath comes, you can enjoy the rest. If you ain't labored, you can't enjoy no rest because you're resting all the time. <laughs> Did you know that in Paul's day, there were some Christians at Thessalonica. They believed that Jesus was coming soon, so they decided they didn't need to work. That the Lord is coming soon, so we don't need to do nothing but just sit and wait on him. So they would sit upon the highest mountain and wait for the return of Christ. They wouldn't even earn money to feed themselves. But I want you to know that Paul sure enough straightened them out. For, for he told them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, Work with your own hands as we commanded you that ye walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. And uh, doing your own work, just as we told you before, as a result, people who are not Christians will trust and respect you, uh, and you will not need to depend on others for money to pay your bills. There are people that just depend on other folk all the time. Now, I know every now and then we all need a little help, but all the time. Somebody said, don't borrow money. Uh, don't let your friend borrow money from you. It's dangerous. It will damage their memory. God expects us to work. Only people who are disabled are people that have critical chronic illnesses. Amen. I want you to know that even children need to learn how to work. And parents, it is now job not to let them sit around and watch television all day long. We need to teach them how to work while they're young. My dear wife went to Taco Bell and said, I got them some sons need a job. <laughs> Amen. They do need a job. My daddy, bless his heart. I, when, I, when it was, you know, when I was growing up, I, Lord Jesus, I hated him. <laughs> Two things I remember. Number one, don't let him walk in the room and you sitting there watching television unless it was a football game like, like the Cowboys. I'll move on, on from that. Um, 
but, 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 but generally, he wouldn't just let us sit around. So when he came, if we watching TV and we heard his footsteps coming, we get up out of that room because he wasn't going. He was going to find something for us to do. Second of all, during the summer when he knew we were out of school, the old man had the half of the backyard plowed for a garden. Guess who were going to be the ones to tend the garden? Early in the morning, out there hoeing the garden, out there pulling up the weeds, out there cultivating, and then when the, you know, the eggplant and the okra and stuff, then we were out there harvesting that stuff. I mean, he had worked us so much, my brother said he was going to pave all of his, uh, of his uh, yard with, with concrete. He didn't want to see no grass. But I want to tell you, it is good to teach your children how to work. And those skills of God and then help me to get a few jobs at Oakwood University. Are oh, you hearing me? If you learn how to work, you will never be broke. Am I right about it? And you ought not be afraid of work. And work ought to not be a bad word. Is that right? Now, I know that those that talk about owning your businesses and, all, and, all, and that's fine. And I think you ought to. But I think you ought to work before you get there. Can you say amen? Remember that Jesus was a carpenter. And he worked. He worked. Probably, if he started as a teenager, Jesus worked almost 20 years before he began his ministry. Most people don't realize Jesus worked longer as a carpenter than he did in his ministry. That was only three and a half years. Think about that. And our inspired messenger says he was as perfect a workman with his carpentry as he was perfect in character. I wish I could have seen some of the things that Jesus made. You got to learn, ladies, young ladies, you got to learn how to work, learn how to cook, learn how to take care of business. If you learn how to work, you'll never be poor. But there are those that are just lazy, indolent, and think they're going to let the government take care of them. Having children out of wedlock and expect somebody else to. I know this is hard, but I'm just telling the truth. But God gives us, here it is, the ability to gain wealth. Do you know that not only physically, but mentally, you are able to come up with ideas and able to come up with legitimate businesses and ways by which you can earn a sufficient living. God has given you a mind. I remember a young man came up to me and said, I'm broke. I don't have no money. I ain't got no job. I ain't got nothing. I said, yeah, what's your plan? Because a plan don't cost you nothing. All you got to do is just sit down and come up with a plan. Look around with what you got and look around with what's possible and look around and see what you can do and take inventory. God has given everybody some kind of talent, ability. He gives us the ability to earn Wealth. Am I right about it? So God is able to bless and God is able to sustain us and God has, is able to give his blessings upon men. But second of all, our finances are based on the promises of God, based on what everybody, the promises of God. And I'm glad that God has given us some powerful powerful promises that he will provide, that he will 
take care of us, uh, that he will sustain us, uh, that if we will simply uh, uh, follow him and commit ourselves to him, uh, that he will take care of us and supply our need. Can I read some of those promises? Because some of them are powerful, and you never, never, ever, you know, just open your Bible, and, and when you're down and broke, just read some of these promises. Uh, Matthew 6, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, uh, and all these things uh, will be added unto you. Uh, Third John chapter 1 and verse 2. Uh, Beloved, I wish above all things uh, that thou mayest prosper uh, and be in health uh, even as thy soul uh, prospereth. Uh, Psalms 37, 25. Uh, I've been young uh, and now I'm old, uh, yet I have not seen uh, the righteous forsaken uh, nor his seed uh, begging bread. Uh, Luke 6 and verse 38. Uh, give and it shall be given unto you uh, good measure uh, pressed down uh, shaken together and running over uh, and then my favorite Philippians 4 19 uh, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Jesus Christ uh, I want to tell you that these are promises uh, that you can very well take to the bank uh, these are promises uh, that God says uh, that are 100 percent guaranteed that he will supply our need. Let me tell you something. If you're doing your best, God will then add to it. Am I right about it? If you are doing your best, then God will add his best. Is that right? Don't expect God to help you if you ain't doing nothing. Am I right about it? But his promises are real and his promises are true and we can know that his promises will come to pass. Is that right? But then that requires us to have faith in his promises. We've got to have faith in the promises of God. We've got to believe that what God says he means. And that what he says will come to pass. you got to believe it with all of your heart. And know that the God who is creator of all things, the God that supplies all the needs of everybody, will take care of you. He knows your situation. He knows your talents. He knows your abilities. He knows where you are in age. He knows what you've accomplished. He knows the things you failed in. God will come to our, to, our, to our need based on his promises. And the Bible tells me that God cannot lie. You know, there are people that made financial promises, come up with Ponzi seems like Bernie Madoff, and they weren't worth a dime. There have been companies that have promised, you know, uh, their retirement funds and like Enron and failed people miserably. But I want to tell you the God that I serve has never failed anybody. Is that right? He blesses us uh, and he promises that his promises are true. Now, let me say that. Let me add this carry. God did not ever promise that everybody was going to be filthy rich. In fact, he never intended for everybody to be filthy rich. Now, I want you to check this out. Before sin, everybody was going to be equally rich. <laughs> everybody will we'll have had more than what they needed. Everybody would be a millionaire, is that right? I'm telling you, it was so, it's so rich that, you know, um, our inspired messenger says that the gold and the silver, they was just laying out on the land. You didn't even have to, you didn't have to dig for the diamonds and all that stuff, it's right just on the land. You, didn't, you know, the flood buried all that stuff, but everybody could be a millionaire, but after sin, 
after sin, everybody would not be financially rich. Two reasons. Number one, everybody can't afford spiritually to be rich. Jesus made the statement in Matthew, what profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? What do you think is more important to God? You being saved in his kingdom or you being rich? He'd rather you be saved. Am I right about it? Now, he said he will take care of our needs. What? He did not promise that everybody would be rich. Now, that does not mean that there were some righteous people who were not rich. There were some righteous people who were rich. Abraham was one of the richest men in the East because God could trust Abraham with his riches. Can you say amen? Uh, uh, there were others, Job, and, and I could go on, that men, that David, and, and others that were rich, Solomon, uh, men that were rich, God, and even some of them had problems and, and messed up with their riches. God, God had men that were rich. Even when our Lord died, there were two rich men that came to bury him, Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea. I love what the Spirit of Prophecy says that... Uh, Nicodemus was so rich, he could support the whole city of Jerusalem for five years out of his own pocket. And when the early church got to be persecuted, and when the apostles began to go out and spread the news everywhere, and Paul began to travel and Peter began to travel, who do you think was the travel budget? <laughs> it was Nicodemus. Are you listening to me? And in fact, the spirit of prophecy said he spent his wealth holding and supporting the early church. Joseph of Arimathea giving the Lord his tomb. God has had rich men. But here's the issue. Here's the issue. God wants success stories at all levels of the economic ladder. He wants success stories at the highest level. He wants success stories of those that are middle class. He even wants success stories of those that are poor. You remember the parable of the talents? They gave one five, gave one uh, 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 two, and one one. And all of them had different talents, but they all had the ability to increase the talent that they had except the man that buried his talent. Am I right about it? And so God gives us his promises if by faith we will reach out to him. There are some people that could do better, but they don't have enough faith to do it. They just don't believe. They just think they're supposed to be poor. And they think they can't do any better. But you've got to do better. Is that right? And you can do better if you have faith. Can you say amen? But now faith has two parts of it. And I'm almost about to bring this in. For the Bible tells me in James that faith without works is dead. James says it over and over again that in order for your faith to be legitimate, it's got to be backed up by works. Now, that's a kind of a, a, a difficult uh, statement because we are not saved by faith alone and we're not saved by works alone. And we're not even saved by faith and works. We are saved, get this now, if you don't get anything, we are saved by faith that works. Faith that works. Works is the follow-through of faith. Am I right about it? And when we accent our faith and believe that we've got to follow it through with action, is that right? That's why I said it's important for you to work. Is that right? But let me tell you, my young people, young people, it's important for you to get an education. If you want a good paying position, if you want to be able to have a good salary, then you've got to get the best education and the best training that you can get. Go as high and as far as you can. 
My wife just bought the book by Mrs. Obama, Becoming. And here's this little girl brought up in Chicago. Poor parents or parents that were low on the totem pole, but she concentrated on her, on her studies. And she, she made good grades. Young people, listen to this. And she was able, if you make good grades, money will come to you. They call it scholarships. So don't think about going to school as just something that I got to do or something I don't like doing or something that just didn't, that got to be done. I want to tell you that you can earn something by getting good grades. You can get a scholarship. Somebody will pay you to go to school. And then you'll get paid after you graduate from school. Oh, you don't hear me. So, so every day you need to concentrate on your studies because they, it's putting your faith into action. Can you say amen? amen? Putting your faith into action. The second thing is for us grown up people and putting our faith into action is that, you know, we have finances and, and most of us have a certain limited amount of finances. We don't need none of us millionaires, but even if you're a millionaire, you probably do it. And that you gotta learn how to how to plan your spending. It's called a budget. I don't know that's a word that a lot of black folk don't even like to hear. Budget. They think it's something, you know, difficult, something hard, something, you know, but if you don't tell your money where to go before it goes, you won't know where it went after it's gone. So you got to have a plan for spending. You know why you got to have a plan for spending? Because every day there are people studying ways to get your money. The advertisers they ain't got those advertisers, those lovely, wonderful, powerful advertisements for nothing. They're trying to get your money. They're trying to get you to buy it. They're trying to get you to, to get food. They're trying to get you to, to get go here and get this there. And you need this uh, and you need that. Uh, and the big word they always use is, we got a sale. Well, let me tell you something. A sale ain't a sale if you ain't got the money. <laughs> if you got to go into debt to get a sale, then you really have messed up the sale. Am I right about it? But you need to prioritize your spending. Prioritize your spending and come up with a budget so that you can know how your money needs to be spent. At the top of the budget, this will be your tithes and your offerings. Now, I know people don't believe this. They think it's old school. They don't think that, this, but you know the Bible promises. If you will bring the tithes and the offering, I will we what? Open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there should not be what everybody that should not be what everybody. Now, I want you to think about that budget now. Think about that budget. And I want you to see that budget and your spending without giving God his tithe. And then I want you to show it with giving God his tithe. You see, the difference is uh, that without his giving God his tithe, there will come things that will come up uh, and things by which the devil uh, will try to steal away your little money. That's why the Bible says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Uh, and with that having that tithe, an offering uh, at the top of the budget, all of the blessing now fall down to the rest of the budget. All of it falls down to the rest of the budget. Am I right about it? God didn't say that. He meant it. It's a guarantee. It's the only place in the Bible the Lord said, check out my guarantee. Prove me now. 
here where it said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the winds of I will pour out a blessing that there should not be room enough uh, to receive it and God will bless what is left uh, and make sure that it will stretch. The reason why I know that because we worship a God uh, who defies the laws of mathematics. Uh, he can add by subtraction uh, and he can multiply by division. He told uh, Elisha to tell the woman, would a woman give me that last meal and make a cake for me? And that's subtraction, right? But when she came back, the meal barrel was full. And the oil never went dry because God can add by what? Subtraction. Jesus took a little boy's lunch, uh, just five barley loaves and two fishes, uh, and divided it up, uh, and he was able to feed 5,000 people besides men, women, and children because he can multiply by division. So don't you think that God can take your little budget and somehow stretch it so that it will supply? Now, Another thing is you got to do is you got to be careful about credit. I'm just telling y'all the truth here. Now, I know we live in a credit age and uh, everything is done by credit. That means when you're using credit, you're using somebody else's money. And you have to be credit with credit for two things. Credit is like fire. It can warm you or it can burn you up. And you will literally, if you get in too much of it, you will sold your soul, as they said, to the company store. And some of these crazy credit cards got interest rates 20, 27, I saw one 32%. Now, you, can I put that in perspective? 27, 32%, can I put that in perspective? Suppose God said, don't give me 10%, I need 32%. But God has always been 10%. It's always will be 10%. He's never gone up. Am I right about it? But these credit cards, they'll go up on you. Is that right? They'll give you a little promotional uh, time. And then when the time runs out, they jack that, uh, that, that, that interest rate. Am I right about it? You've got to be careful about your interest and try by the grace of God to have a goal. To, I'm talking to young people too. Have a goal to live debt free as much as possible. Debt free as much as possible. I know you can't buy a house without debt and you can't buy a car without debt, but then everything else, you need to figure out a way by the grace of God. And this is something you've got to plan for. You, it doesn't happen just automatically. You've got to plan for it. And then you have to have, and I hate to say it, but I've got to tell the truth. Y'all don't mind me. Y'all ain't going to get mad at me. If you get mad, you just get mad because I just tell you. You need adequate insurance. You need adequate insurance for now and the future. You need medical insurance because the older you get, the more your body will go out of whack. And the more you're going to need the doctor. I always say that the older you get, the more the doctor needs to be your friend. Well, you can't afford all the medical costs. You better make sure you got some good insurance. Sometimes it's provided by your, by your job. And now with Medicare, they, they do that part. But for those that are not under you got to make sure that you are taking care of your health. Because, it, you know, uh, uh, what you have to do is make sure you do preventive health and try to stay in health as much as possible by maintaining a, a, a yearly examination so that you'll know where you are. Are you listening to me? And then you need, then you need life insurance. Well, not mainly necessarily for them, for them kids and yours, which is, that, 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 that's debated. 
They shouldn't have to be that we have to take up an offering to bury you. I don't know, that's not, that's not nice to say and may not even be proper in the pulpit. But it, guess what? It is the facts of life. Dust thou art. And if Jesus don't hurry him, come unto dust shall thou return. And so you might as well be ready for it. You might as well get ready for it and should not make it somebody else's responsibility. Oh, y'all quiet in me. So what I'm, I'm going to end. In order for our finances to be blessed by God and to help us in the future, management is mandatory and responsibility is required. Let me say that one more time. Management of our funds is mandatory and responsibility is required. When Jesus told a parable, he ended with the good steward by saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant faithful. That's what the Lord is looking for. Faithful. To be faithful to him in your worship. Faithful to him in your walk with God. Faithful to him in your giving in your tithes and your offering. The Lord says that tithe belongs to me. You don't give it, you return it. You only give a thank you offering. Well done. Oh, I want to hear him say, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. And then he says, you've been faithful over a few things. You've been faithful on these little things that I've given to you. You've been faithful with your finances. You've been faithful with watching your debt. You've been faithful that, 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 you are, uh, that you are making sure that you're taking care of business the right way. Faithful of a few things. He says, behold, I'll make you ruler over many. Oh, I'm about finished. Jesus says that if we are faithful to the end, He's going to elevate us and he's going to insult us. We will be higher than the angels. We will be raised past the seraphims and the cherubims. We'll be able to do what not even Lucifer was able to do. He says, I'm going to let you sit with me on my throne. That throne that rules the entire universe. That throne that the devil wanted to take by, uh, by, by force. He said, I'm going to let you sit with me on my throne and let you live forever and ever. Forever.